It is always special for me to be here in Azerbaijan. I feel sometimes it's become my second home. I'm here so much. But it's a very important place to be. It's a very small country, but it's a very strategic one. Not just in the sense that the northern border is Russia, and the southern border is Iran, and you have a relationship of some sort with my country, the United States, but because as an oil producer, your interests run to Central Asia, to Turkey, and to Europe. You are one of those small countries that has global interests. And therefore, you can't simply speak of your neighborhood. Your future rests in the world. Whether this is good or not is another question, but it's Azerbaijan's reality. And so I want to speak of the world a bit and how it affects you. Because I think we are at a crucial point, turning point in history. In 1989 to 1991, a series of things happened in the world. The fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Japanese miracle, Tiananmen Square, Maastricht, Desert Storm. In those three years, the world changed fundamentally. Azerbaijan changed fundamentally. And everybody waited after it was done that it would all go back to the way it was. It never did. We are now entering the post-Cold post War world. I wish I had a better name for it, but I can't think of it. The history will tell us what it is later. But the post-Cold War world is ending. The post-Cold War world rested on three pillars. One was the United States, the world's leading economic power, its leading military power. The second was Europe, unifying the greatest economic power in the world, really, and moving toward a single integrated voice in the world, counterbalancing the United States. And the third was China the high growth country that was transforming Asia. Two of these three pillars are in deep crisis. China, let me begin with, has ceased to be the low wage country. It is now cheaper to find labor in Mexico than in China. Cheaper to find labor in Bangladesh by far, cheaper to find it in Peru. China is now a country, as Japan was in 1991, in a forced reconstruction. It cannot any longer compete on the global market in low wages, so it is attempting to become a high-tech country, competing with Japan, United States, South Korea, Germany, Britain. It is not so easy to become a high-tech competitor. It only looks that way. China is a great country. It has grown for 30 years. It has done magnificently. It is not going to go away. Japan did not go away. But its period at the center of high growth, low wage development is over. And this, of course, profoundly affects the energy markets because so many of the calculations for demand and energy were based on the idea that China would grow forever. Nothing grows forever. And China is now reaching its climax. But of far more importance is the fact that the European Union has collapsed. It's still there. They have meetings. They get together. But the day when the French president and the German chancellor sat down as European leaders is over. The French president now represents the interests of France. The chancellor of Germany represents the interests of Germany. The prime minister of Greece speaks for Greece. The common market was more than just a free trade zone. It was a vision of a single integrated Europe 
that put its history behind it. That after 31 years of horror, it would now be over. It is hard to put your history behind you. And what happened in 2008 was a fundamental challenge to Europe. The sovereign debt crisis that followed the crisis of 2008 was solved by austerity. Austerity created unemployment. 27% of Greeks are unemployed. But it's worse than that because we have a friend who earned $3,000 a month as an architect. He now earns $800 a month. In Southern Europe, an entire generation has lost its future. When you have unemployment like this, it doesn't solve itself in a year. It is a generational event. And it means that someone who lost his job at the age of 40 will never again live the way he did. And someone who's becoming a professional at 25, maybe 20 years before he has his dream. There are now two Europes, Southern Europe and Northern Europe, Germany, Austria, uh, the Czech Republic, Northern France, all have unemployment rates of 6% or less. Southern Europe, Spain, Portugal, southern France, southern Italy have unemployment rates that are higher than it was during the 1920 depression in Europe, and the 1930 depression in the United States. One part of Europe is in depression. One part of Europe is prospering. This is an untenable situation. You cannot create a single entity with such a divergence in economic and social reality. And you see it in its foreign policy. France wants to attack Syria for some reasons I don't understand. Germany doesn't want to attack Syria for much better reasons, I think. The British wish to attack Syria, but my parliament won't let them attack Syria. There is no coherent, concerted European foreign policy just as there is no coherent domestic policy. Now, the Europeans will tell you that this can all be solved, to which I've always answered, then solve it. It's been five years. If you can solve it, solve it. It's not that some think tank hasn't thought of the solution. It hasn't that the professor hasn't written his paper yet. It is that there's a fundamental contradiction in Europe, which consists of the following. Germany exports the equivalent of 41% of its GDP every year. It must export. Like China, it is dependent on exports. And this unbalances every smaller nation around it as German exports move, outcompete, and dominate the market so you don't have the social development. Germany desperately needs the free trade zone and the euro to manage its export-addicted economy. The rest of Europe don't need Germany to be so successful at exporting. And the question arises to these countries, and watch Hungary because it's very interesting, why should we pay back our debts? Will we be better off if we do or better off if we don't? And the Germans do not want to have this conversation. But this conversation is being had. And so Azerbaijan must face a very important fact. The demand for energy that was driven by China is not necessarily quite there. Not gone, but not there, the growth. The assumption that there is such a thing as Europe that Azerbaijan will one day be part of is not there. Because it is very difficult to find Europe anymore. There are so many different Europes. They are competing so deeply. They cooperate on so little. This is a very different world than you were in before. Now, of course, everybody, as in 1991, expects it to go back the way it was. 
I remember in the United States, we were sure that very shortly the Soviet Union would rise up again. We called warriors, couldn't believe that it was gone. Japan would recover. Everything would go back as it was. It never does. The fantasy that Europe, after this existential crisis, would return to what it was before, I think is a fantasy. There will, of course, be a Europe. It will be wealthy. But it will be a, well con it will be a continent of nations, as it is now and it was, as it was always before. There will not be United Nations of Europe. To me, the break point became when France intervened in Mali and Germany refused to go. The foundation of the European Union is the idea of Franco-German friendship because th that animosity was the foundation of two terrible world wars. They're not enemies, but they no longer simply listen to each other. The change between 2007 and today in Europe is stunning. It is extraordinary. And it is probably the single most important change in the way the world works, or expected it to work. And it has a profound effect on Azerbaijan in a way that is not obvious. Because as Europe weakens, the countries of Eastern Europe and the periphery of Russia find themselves without a NATO that functions, without a European Union with teeth, with a European Union that is borrowing money desperately in all places that they can find, and a Russia that sees an opportunity, not because it's the old Soviet Union, but because it has legitimate concerns about the expansion of NATO, if there was such a thing anymore. <laughs> but more than that, it sees opportunities to expand its influence. And it expands its influence not with tanks, but with business deals. And expands its influence not by trying to tell Europe what to do, but by making certain that there are certain things they cannot do because of dependence on energy. From the American point of view, relations between itself and Russia have never been worse since the fall of the Soviet Union. The Snowden affair was an enormous psychological shock. It caused the president to cancel a meeting with Putin and then cancel another meeting at the G20. Why? It is one thing to take a defector. It's another thing to parade him around. The Russians wanted to humiliate us. This is a very bad thing to do. But particularly in Syria, where the United States has a problem, it does not want to get rid of the Assad regime. It wants to get rid of Assad. The Russians want to save the Assad regime. They created it in 1970. The unwillingness of the Russians to cooperate in any way means that Putin's claim of partnership is not there. It takes the United States a very long time to change its mind. And the mind is not yet changed. But I think within this administration, the view of Russia is very different. And the interest of what they are doing in parts of the world that a year ago the United States was indifferent to has changed. I wrote many years ago that Europe would face this crisis and that the outcome would be a rising Russia, not because it's so powerful, but because everyone around them is so weak. And I think we're there. But as always in the past century, the United States has options that it doesn't even know. The foundation of Russian power is energy, its ability to export it, to influence people around there, its periphery. In the United States, a revolution in energy technology has taken place as fundamental in changing things as Silicon Valley was in the 1980s. What has been invented in the United States has turned the United States into a net exporter of oil. If someone had said 20 years ago that this was possible, 
they would have laughed, but it's the reality. And it is the thing that is the most dangerous thing to the Russians. Because in the end, it is energy that they stand on. And in the end, it is simply American businessmen developing reserves elsewhere that reduces the price of energy and the dependence on Russian goods. It is very strange for me to be, after all these years, sitting here talking about Russia as if it were an en enemy. And yet, when you go to Washington, that's the way it looks. And then, this affects Azerbaijan in two ways. One I think is good. You've always wanted a counterbalance. <laughs> you may now have one. The other is bad. What is happening technologically in the United States will, of course, affect Azerbaijan as well. It will affect every country that's an energy exporter. And as one of the Saudi ministers have said recently, this is the greatest threat to Saudi Arabia in a long time. But Azerbaijan also has a policy of diversification, of developing other industries, of not simply being dependent on this. And the closer the relationship with the United States, the more access to American technology and ideas, the more this can evolve. Throughout the periphery, we see Russian pressure, Russian activity, not Russian aggression, nor Russian hostility, merely Russians pursuing Russian interests. I think you will see soon, as I, I said many years ago, a return of an American presence. I think the world very frequently underestimates the United States. I remember in the 1980s, everybody thinking that the United States was finished but it was not the United States that collapsed. Underestimating the United States has for 100 years proved not a good idea. But I would say, personally, that not only is the mutual interest of the United States and Azerbaijan obvious, but it is becoming more obvious every year. There are many things that are politically difficult to do, but when I think of when I first came to this country, I think it was in 2008, and I think of the relationship and the interaction today, the access to weapons, the access to technology, the visibility of Azerbaijan in our country, it seems to me that we have reached a turning point. But it is necessary for every country to consider the changing world. Your vision may, in the end, be the only thing left of the European Union. I don't think that. I think European Union will exist in some form, but it will never take the form that was fantasized in 2007. There are too many differences and too many hostilities. You are the eastern part of Europe. It's eastern edge. You face Asia. You face Europe. You have a pipeline policy, which is your strategic policy. You must align it with the Russians. You must align it with the Turks. You must somehow get it to Vienna. You are part of Europe, whether you want to be. I think the important thing when we speak about the security situation in South Caucasus is to bear in mind the changing condition in Europe to get used to the change and stop believing that they will certainly hold a meeting of the ministers and work out these minor problems. This is now a permanent condition, the new normal. Azerbaijan has options. Azerbaijan is not without friends. The Russians are not about to invade. <laughs> You're probably stronger than the Iranians. But still, you have to bear in mind that the world changes, and Azerbaijani national interest stays the same. To remain secure, to remain prosperous, to maintain good relations with everyone you can, and to make sure you're not dependent on any one power. This will become more difficult, but history has never been easy for Azerbaijan. I can only say that there are Americans who are deeply committed 
to the national interest of Azerbaijan, not necessarily because they all love Azerbaijan, but because they see the interest the United States has here. I ask you to be patient with my country. It's hard. But still, our country is your best ally and is becoming more and more known and more and more evident. But I ask for one thing, that you understand how the world is changing and that we not create demons out of Russians. They're not. They're reasonable people pursuing their interests. We not create saints out of Europeans. We're just ordinary people. That we understand the ordinariness of the people we deal with. And we understand that their interests may not always be the same as ours. So the message I take to you, the world has changed. Heydar Aliyev, who I regard as a great man, was someone who understood before anyone else that the world had changed and acted on it. And Azerbaijan is a country that was founded by recognizing the truth before anyone else did. You are now in that same position. Not as dangerous, but still that position.